Good morning, everyone. I am going to get started. It's 10 past 10. Uh, welcome to this session uh, and welcome to the second week of our online classes. Uh, and today is the 1st of April, so welcome to April also. Um, we will continue to do uh, what we have started doing last time, but we'll start a new topic today on Besideability. And, and uh, before we get started, I want to get people coming in and I would do my usual thing, a couple of questions before we get started with the real stuff we have to discuss. And just so you know, what I will be asking you today have got connections with what we'll be doing. And so I'll start question number one. And, and I know some of you would probably want me to do this on poll. I'm not doing any research or anything. And the poll is something that I won't see. So I enjoy when people write up their answers and I look at them and, and it gives me a chance to look, uh, you know, tally the kind of answers that came around later on. So let's do this and we'll not use more than a minute or two. So the first question I have is going to be this. What is your favorite music genre? And you can you can tell me in one word what it is. Uh, you start typing and I'll give you a little bit of a minute and we'll have another qu question that is related to that. Uh, and so I'll, I'll write, and, and so pop, rap, rock and roll, whatever it is that you think, uh, in a word or two, uh, you let me know. I'll, I'll watch a little bit. And there are some people who are joining, and so it will also give them a chance to get, to get, uh, most of you are writing one, which is what I like. Uh, uh, sometimes there would be things where you would want to see more than one answer, like the cat and dog last time, there were people who would. If you give me something like that, I'll count you in both beans. But one answer will be the best because it's, I'm asking for your favorite. Okay, for those joining new, uh, we are writing what our favorite music genre is. And that's question number one. Got all kinds of interests. This is a very interesting class. The more I know you, uh, I know 50% of the class drinks coffee, the other 50% drinks tea. Uh, I know a few things. And color wise, you're all over the place. Uh, but there are some things that are kind of right in between. Uh, blue and red are your favorite colors, by the way, just in case you didn't know. The class's favorite colors, the majority. Question number two. You can write question number one answer if you uh, are coming late. You just write what your favorite um, music genre is and I will know from the answer what question you are referring to. Question number two, do you think you can design a Turing machine that decides or determines music type so you have known you're not will take music it has got nodes it has got things uh and the Turing machine is going to determine whether this one belongs to pop or r b or or whatever it, it is and your answers are like this yes no i don't know or let me think about it if you've already answered it doesn't matter but Yes, no, I don't know. Let me think about it. Hmm. Can you, do you think you can design a Turing machine that would determine music type, genre, is the question. Okay. Um, keep thinking about that one um, and, and you, respond. My last question is going to be a practical one. 
I sent you scans of your homework five, and I used the scanner that I told you about. Your homework six is due now on Friday, and some of you would be typing up, some of you would be scanning and sending things, and some of you might be considering using the, that scanner that I use, some of you may be doing some other way, but what I want to know is what you told the quality of the scan you got. Uh, of the homework. So, so I'm assuming that you've seen it, that the scan I sent you. And if you have seen it, on a scale of one to five, tell me the quality of the scan that you get it is, just a number. So on a scale, five being the best. On a scale of one to five, how good was the quality of the scan? you got for your homework five. Okay. So this is going to be interesting. If it was not something that was not good, and it could be me, so, you know, that you get a chance to actually edit things and make them, frame them the right way and so on. And, and you can imagine I had that some 65 or so the, to do, and there were five or six pages each, and it was quite some time that it took. And so I might have messed up some places where it could have been better. So it might not be the tool's fault. But if you were not happy with it, the thing that I would suggest if you are going to be scanning is to do something that you know better, whatever tool that may be. There may be other things that are around. And so I would encourage you to use them if you were not happy. If you were happy and if you've seen that video uh, Professor Schneider made, then use it for uh, doing your homework five. Okay. Uh, so we've got your answers at the end when uh, the Zoom recording comes, I will get to tally it and I will let you know what your responses were like and we will get to one of the responses you have uh, when we start discussing today. All right, I'm going to get started. If Before I do so, is there anybody else got any question for me? You can always unmute yourself and ask and I'm hoping that my audio is good enough today and you can hear me clearly. Uh, if that's not the case, somebody gives me a nod. So, so I would like you to participate whenever I initiate something. Other than that, if you are quiet, I will assume that things are going fine. You are listening to me. Either you have had your coffee or tea or you still you have it by your side. That's my assumption. If something is not right, is when you would raise your hand or, or unmute yourself and ask. So I'm going to assume, where do we get the scans? I have sent it. So Kevin, I have sent them by by... Osbol mail. And so if you go to Osbol and check your mail box there, then the, they, they should be there. So yes, so, so this is how it happens. And that was what I tried to do last time. Uh, when you go to Osbol, uh, you get notifications when things happen and so on. But there is a mailbox. That was what I tried to demonstrate last time from my desktop where unfortunately it got interrupted for uh, 30 seconds. And I don't want to do that now, so I want to stay here. But if you go there, there is a mail, there's just the mailbox like everything else. And there, whenever you have mail from me or anybody else who sent you through that, you will get, and that has got attachments. So you should be able to get it there. If you have not, I would like to hear today, right after the class, let me know. So go to your, you can also get it through your notifications, click on it and you'll get a message, but it should be in your mailbox. Sunday had got some activities where I was sending so many posts uh, and, and ultimately I discovered that it was sent successfully, at least from my end. And so you should go there and check and find out. Okay, so it looks like we are all good and we'll get started with decidability. So April Fall is being mentioned, so, so this is going to be serious man. we're going to make some decisions and look at things and so uh, let's get started in the last lecture uh, we did I thought that was a good thing for us to have and especially for those of you who had yet to be convinced why are we doing a theory class uh, that that you know definition accurate definition of algorithm and the 
you know, fundamental result we saw from Church and Turing theses was, was a hopefully convincing one. And you probably have followed the argument along. And so we did that. And we did do towards the third quarter of it or so, establish a format and notation how to describe them. So from now on, we'll be looking at uh, Turing machines uh, for the purpose of studying algorithms, for the purpose of having to talk about things that are possible to do and things that are not possible to do algorithmically and speaking. And so for that reason, the book has, and we will be following certain formats and certain notations and how to, to be described. And so I did spend some time talking about that. And there was an issue about, or, or something that needs to be about encoding. And I looked, I started looking at an example and that's where we stopped. And that's what I want to pick up today because that example was something that, uh, uh, so, so, so uh, I've, 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 I'm seeing a question on, on the chat. I will keep my eye on the chat, and, but I want to get there. I will remember it and answer, answer later on. Uh, and if not, then I would offline answer it. So there's no problem. Don't worry. If you see something, if you ask me and I didn't respond to you, it's not because I ignore it. It's just because I haven't seen it or I would like to continue with this one. So uh, we, we, we looked at an example and I didn't finish that example. And so I want to bring up that one. And especially on one point, I want to talk about the detail and then we'll get to our topic today. The example is actually an interesting one. Sometimes the way we have been looking at things now, the problems may not look that familiar, right? I mean, when there was regular expression, maybe you could say, okay, when I was doing this thing on Unix or, or when I was doing on a Linux machine, I had to write regular expressions. And so I wrote LS and then some expressions, which is essentially about regular expression and trying to match up things. And then there might be a few things that you could immediately relate yourself to see how, how they were. So they were formulated in terms of language, which might be a little bit foreign from what you do every day or what you study in other courses and so on. But this example, uh, in addition to its simplicity, I thought would be a good one. And, and it was good that the book had it because you might have seen in this. You might have seen a graph somewhere. Uh, and, and so the question or the, the language we are considering now is a set of language uh, uh, graphs when they are connected. So you'll call a graph connected when you can start from one node and reach anybody else. If you cannot do that, if there is somebody isolated, then it, that graph is not connected. So this example uh, on, the, on the slide had got, is not connected. It has got three pieces to be exact. And so we could take one of these and then try to see uh, how we would formulate a Turing machine algorithm for this one that would decide whether, it, whether a graph is a member of this language. In other words, whether the graph is connected. This is the example. I think I came to this point and we wrote an algorithm for it. And this was the purpose of this one. When I call an example here, what I mean is here is a notation we have for how we describe a Turing machine algorithm uh, with its indentations, what we assume of the input and how things are organized. That was the point there. And, and this will be sufficient for what Whatever else we will do from now on in the remaining lectures, for whatever else you would do in exercises or homeworks that they might ask you, unless you're asked to specifically talk about details. So there is no need for having to go in more detail than what this one is saying. This is where I stopped, but there is also something that I would like to go in detail that is not a usual practice to point out a couple things. First, so, so let's just very quickly review this one. So, so we have our machine now is called M. It will take the input, that encoding of G. That's what those parentheses mean. Uh, we have this as an input, and then we've got these states. Select the first node of G to mark it. By the way, the, the connectedness problem that I just told you, if you have encountered it in other courses, you know what to do with it. So if you have a graph, you've got some data structure for it. And so you go around and do basically, uh, you know, a, Breads for search and try to make sure that you have reached everybody and then from then on you can reach everybody and if every you know all the nodes are marked then you will call it connected this is how you would do it when you are not doing it on a turing machine but we want to see it on a turing machine now and the idea is not that different so we select a place to start the first node of the graph and then mark it and we repeatedly following the stage we would would, would come to a new node that's no new that's not marked and for each node we mark it if it's attached by an age to a node that's already marked and and this way we 
get the chance to go through the graph, all of it, and then we have marked them in some sense, and then we scan. We scan the nodes to determine whether they are all marked. If they are, that means our exploration has discovered them. Our Turing machine will accept, otherwise it will reject. This is how it will do. So I just run through this one. We, we have talked about it, and, and we will stop here normally. But for now, I want to talk about a little bit of implementation detail on this one. Uh, and because of the few things that we will do today that will come up and then say, oh, we have a technique that we introduced here and we need it. Uh, that's one reason. And the other reason is because I want you to be entirely convinced that this higher level presentation, the high level presentation of Turing machine algorithms we're doing is not cheating. If we were to implement it, if you were to, to go around and, and actually have an, uh, something that would be implemented, we can. It's for the purpose we have now, for the kind of analysis we do, for the kind of decisions we make. And that is sufficient, is the point. Otherwise, it, uh, you can go to a lower level detail. So for this reason, I want to, to show you first how the, an encoding might be done. So encoding is a bit tricky. Uh, we make this thing, just we begin the line by saying we have this object and it is encoded and it's always possible. And last time I told you, uh, there may be different ways in which you can input, uh, take an input and encode it. And it doesn't matter for what we will be doing at the end, I say it. And, and for the purpose we have, because we want to turn them into language, we will always assume the input is a string, and if we have multiple of them, we'll put them right next to each other. This we agreed on last time. And so let's see how this would actually be done if our input is a familiar thing like a graph. And what would the encoding look like? And here is an example uh, on four nodes. And so the nodes are named, or the vertices are named one through four. And what you see on the right is it's encoding as a string. And so now these numbers uh, happen to be something that we could use to identify them. And so a graph, I'm hoping now that everybody is familiar with this, is a set of nodes and a set of ages, or a set of vertices and a set of ages. Uh, vertices and edges, right? And so the, this encoding now is turned into a string and the string is made up of two things. The first one corresponding to the set of nodes and the second one corresponding to the set of edges. And so the nodes we just enumerate, we list them. And so we've got four of them. We have decided to call them one, two, three, four. That's what they are called. And so now this is a number. It's a, it's a dec you know, decimal number, but, but we have, you know, just like we have been seeing when we were looking at regular language uh, or, or things that were, um, you know, not regular. And so we would say we have zeros and ones, zero is appearing n times one is appearing just like that. Now we have got these numbers. And so one, two, three, four is how many we have in terms of this graph. And so that's a set of nodes. The second one is a set of ages. And the edges will be a pair of nodes at a time. So, so I've got an age that's called one, two. There is an age called two, three. There is another age one, three. That's a fourth one, one, four. In this case, there are four. And so we just list them. And so now we have a complete encoding of this graph that has been turned into a string. That is one of the details I wanted to tell you. When I just look at this, especially for those of you who have worked with some kind of data structure, this is in fact very similar to how we typically store graphs in data structures in when we're doing programming language in, in, in a certain program, in a certain program. So if you've got a node list and you've got an age list. In fact, this is one of the most basic ones. Uh, you could have some structure to it, some organization to it. For example, instead of having just the age lists randomly put like this, you may want to have things that are neighbors of, you know, ages that are results of being neighbors of one, you know, right after one you can, neighbors list, in other words. You can have the ages that are, you know, incident on node two, you can list them. And so you may have some organization or you may organize this some other way. You can think of it in a metrics form and so on. But, but this one, it was an encoding. It is not to the level of having to find a data structure to represent your graph, but still the way it is now looks like one of the ways in which a graph data structure could be, could be used. Okay, so that was the encoding part. The details here is, uh, if you go back to what, what we were saying in uh, how the Turing machine for this one was described, there is the input G and then we go around and do four stages. 
the very first thing we want to do, if we were to implement this, if we really care to go that far, would be to say, is the input that is being given to me actually a graph? Otherwise, no bother to go to these other four things to do now. So we can check whether the input is, uh, the encoding represents a graph. Two things to do. One, is the node list a valid node list? For example, if I go there and then say, instead of having one, two, three, four, I say one, two, two, three, four, then this is not going to be a valid encoding because the node has repeated itself. So at least, at the very least, I want these ones to be unique. But you remember we have seen something that a Turing, this a Turing machine can do because we've seen one called distinct elements in one of the examples we saw a couple lectures ago. So the, the, the Turing machine is capable of knowing, going through a list and whether the elements are distinct or not, for example. So you can check the node list that way. Uh, and then you can check the edge list. The edge list should come from the nodes. And so every pair I list there, I would have to check. Uh, whether it is coming from the node list. If there was a list, uh, a pair here that would say five, six, then I would say, oh no, this encoding is not right. So we don't need to go to the other parts because it's not coming from the node list. So we can check the edge list in that way. That was one part. And then we can go into the stage, the four stages, and, and the markings that we would say, that was say, uh, mentioned in how the Turing machine was described here was, Go to the first node, mark it, and then repeat the following stages for no, until no new nodes are marked. And the thing that we are repeating is for each node in G, mark if it is attached by an edge to a node that's already marked, that's when we will mark it. This means there is some kind of bookkeeping we need to do for these markings. The first one is easy, but for these other ones, we don't want to because we don't have a data structure that would tell us now I am on node one and I'm going to kind of look for neighbors of one that are two, three, and four. I don't have that. This is, I don't have any assumption like that. So I have to keep track whether I have it started from here and I'm looking at a node that is a destination for an age. And so I could mark when I know for sure, but if I am tentatively, I could underline it. And the next time around when I come, if it is underlined or you know indicated with some other mark, then I will fully mark it. So if you, read along in the book, uh, you would find out that this stage one, two, three could have details that we would do to mark every time we have visited a node from, a no uh, uh, from via an edge that traces me back to a node that was marked. So essentially, you can do the first these three stages and mark them. And then once they are marked, we can go through the nodes, just to scan them and see if there is anything that's not marked. This is not a level of detail you would be asked on a Turing machine. This is an implementation detail, but I brought it up and I wanted to talk about it before we get started with today's lecture. First, to show you, convince you at least one concrete example on how an encoding is successfully done. Second, to show you the kind of techniques one could use to mark and, and to uh, you know, scan and things like that. They, so so we, we, we wanted to be aware of those. I wanted you to be aware of those before we get to start to today's lecture. Decidability is our topic and where our objective is to, we have already started this one in some sense when we established the result of Church and Turing last time. What are the limits of algorithmic solvability? That's our objective. That's what we are going to talk about. Uh, I mentioned last time uh, when we were wrapping up the Turing machine discussions, I say this is chapter four in the book. That was a misstatement. Those of you who are viewing uh, the lectures afterwards, if you didn't get a chance or if you wanted to look, there is a place where I say chapter four where I meant chapter three. Chapter four is what we are doing today. And we want to formally see how we can ring, uh, reason when problems are algorithmically solvable and problems are not solvable. And, and the decision form of them is what we will be talking about. And for that reason, it's called decidability. And so fortunately, most problems are algorithmically solvable. Hilbert's tens problem, the one that we encountered last lecture, and so at the, at we discovered either for the first time or if you probably have heard of it, that it is not algorithmically solved. There are problems and we'll see more and more of them. So, so there are certain problems that are algorithmically solvable that can be solved and there are some that are not. Uh, most of you uh, 
I would say, are computer science, and you are already working on things, on projects, on your exercises, or in real life, on problems that can algorithmically be solved, but there are plenty of them. So they're difficult, there are things that we do. So the maturity of our time, in implementation-wise, technology creation-wise, or whatever it is that we do job-wise, is about solving problems that are actually solvable. It's just that we are working on them because we want to, to design better algorithms. Sometimes we want to have many things that are we know how to do, but we, we just have to do them. And so it might look like a little bit of fantasy. Why do we need to bother to study when it's unsolvability? Some of your seniors, you'll graduate and you'll go and go get, uh, you know, working in some fun, exciting place. You've got a manager and they would, you know, they would ask you to do something and you would probably gotten a difficult problem and you come and tell them that this is not solvable, it's unsolvable. It's very unlikely that they would say, oh, let's promote this person. He told me that this cannot be solved. That, that won't happen. But if you do this in a way that means unsolvable algorithmically, it will have another kind of implication. So, so there is a, a, a reason we want to study unsolvability. And the first one is actually uh, maybe surprising, but a practical reason. These problems, when they are not solved, uh, solvable, and we will later on see another way in which we think about intractability where problems are difficult to solve. They are solvable by a computer, but they are difficult. There is a practical utility to knowing that when problems are not solvable. It means then you can use that knowledge to reconsider how the problem was formulated to begin with. And so you could either have a simpler formulation for it, or you can completely reformulate it and deal with another problem because the problem turned out to be provably unsolvable and you found, you found that one. Consider Hilbert's problem. Uh, we knew uh, or we learned that it is unsolvable in its general form, but the one that we started off with when the polynomial is reduced to a single variable, that can be decided. That can be decided, but the general one cannot be. So if you were to see, to know this, and you know now, uh, then you, and you did have a reason to solve that problem, your life depended on it, then the simpler version or the modified or the simpler variant of that problem would be the one that you would need to focus your energy on. So that's simplification. Another one would be that maybe this is not the real thing that we really need to solve for practical purposes, and so we'll have to modify it in this way. That is the practical utility of having to study problems like unsolvability. There is another one, and this one is about perspective. So if you think about, at least for the purpose of decidability, which we will encounter quite a number of examples today, if you were to take every time you get a decision problem, you're going to put them in a one being called decidable and another being called undecidable. Fortunately, we've got more on the decidable ones, by the way. Uh, and if you were to put them, uh, then it's a good idea to come every now and then and look at what these unsolvable or undecidable problems are in this other being to get imagination, to, to, to stimulate imagination and to know them. To, so, so that itself is a good one. So the practical utility is there to reformulate a problem, to reduce it to something or to simplify it or formulate it in a way that would lend it to be solvable or having us to know where the difficulty is lying. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit idealistic here, but some of you may come with a completely different paradigm than what we now know how to compute. And that perspective may come from understanding the limitations of computing as we know it today. I don't know how it would, you would do it, but maybe, maybe you may come up knowing about this limitation on when one problems are undecidable, provably, would make you come up with something. I, I, if I knew, I would have told you, I don't know, but, but the, you, you may get some perspective, either to come uh, to, to get your ideas for some other things, but also to change paradigms. All right, therefore, we will study unsolvability. So, decidable language would be, uh, if we group them into two now, and say decidable and undecidable, uh, after we have established good knowledge on how to characterize and prove things when they are decidable, we will come and look at undecidable. That will be the subject for next lecture. And 
maybe more than one. Uh, but for today, we'll be talking about decidable language. And we'll look at decidable problems concerning finite automata. And we'll be looking at decidable language concerning context-free grammars. Within finite automata, we'll look at three different problems. And I have in listed them there. One has got to do with acceptance, one has got to do with checking for emptiness, and one has got to do with equivalence. So don't worry if I just mentioned them in one sentence now because we will devote time to saying what the problems are and, 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 and showing them, proving them that they are decidable. And we'll do similarly for context-free. We will not have enough time to go up, up, around all five of these uh, and we'll see um, some of them actually have more than one. Also, we'll save context-free grammars for Friday, uh, but we'll look at finite automata formulations today. So let's begin. And so if you are going to uh, help me accountable, so I'll, I'll number them. I'll number the things that we'll go through. And, and, and so there were three, but we will end up having five because in some cases we will, we will have more than one variation. And so count with me, go along. And when you, if you are taking, I know some of you are taking notes and I encourage you to do that. I'll make sure to talk around the slides and, and explain things and that would give you time to take down notes, both by listening and, and also but what you see. Okay, so decidable language is what we will be looking at and we will start with things that are around finite automata. So the first language we want to see is uh, if we have uh, a DFA that accepts an input string. If you remember uh, before spring break when we started, we have been doing stuff like that. Design a DFA that accepts this input string. Does this one rec you know, recognize this language? We have done that type of formulation, but we've turned them now into, uh, into language in this fashion. Uh, so, so now it is you know, formulated in the form of a language. So we choose to do this and everything that we will see now, they will be called decision problems. We will turn computation problems, uh, we will represent them, them by language. So in this case, the problem of testing whether a DFA we'll call it B, accepts an input W is the same as the problem of testing this pair now, the encoding, BW is a member of this language. So, so you've, you've been familiar with the first type, DFA B accepts an input B, we've done, uh, you know, how to, how to do that, and, you know, follow the transition functions of what that DFA would do, and then you will see if it is going to arrive at an accepted state or not, that type of thing you are familiar with. So now it's turned it into a membership of a language, and in that sense, it becomes a decision problem. And so the result is positive, that this language, A, DFA, is a decidable language. And so the pattern I will follow from now on will be to say, will, will formally define the language. It will be a language always, and it will have an encoding of some input, and we will have some description of what that language would be. And then we will say whether that language is decidable or not. And, and we will, when it is decidable, we will exhibit, we will give a proof. The same thing when it is not decidable, but we are not going to present a, a Turing machine that will decide it when it is not decidable. So this is how we will go around and how the format would be. And just because I'm here, I will also tell you how this language will be will be defined. So I'll try to have a subscript that tells us which where we are. So, so in this case, we are working with a deterministic finite automata. That's what the DFA there stands for. And when there is a letter before it, it means what, what the language is. In this case, it's about accepting. And so that's what the A stands for. And so we have an input um, that is of string W and we have turned it, encoded it into something that a, a Turing machine would be able to tell. And so our first claim, our first result today is uh, A DFA is a decidable language. Let's prove it. We will simply need now to present a Turing machine and we'll call that Turing machine M that decides this particular language, A DFA. And, and this one is kind of short and you can imagine why it is because we have a fairly fundamental thing. How you know, how much lower can we go? So, so when we started looking at these models, that was how we started. We began with finite automata and it can't get any, any simpler than what a DFA does, right? So, so, so that's the language and we are basically saying something that we would intuitively think is known to be, will be decidable. So uh, our Turing machine M has got a simple task. It will take this input, 
uh, an encoding of BW, where B is the DFA and W is the string. And what it will do has got two states. It will just simply simulate what the DFA would do. So B, B is our DFA. Uh, and so it will simulate means it, you know, what is how a DFA functions. So, so we have basically states and we've got the start state and a set of final states and there's a transition function. And so the, the, the Turing machine will simulate what this one does on input W. And if the simulation ends in an accepted state of the DFA, the Turing machine will accept it. If it ends in a non-accepting state, it will reject it. So one little reminder there. So you may recall DFAs have a finite, uh, you know, a start state and a finite or some set of uh, accepted states, but there's nothing called rejected state. So, so in this case, any non-accepting state will be a reject for the Turing machine. Okay, so we have our proof done with that green box right there. Uh, I just wanted to show you a little bit of detail here, just like what we did for, for the graph encoding example I showed you. And we will be a little bit uh, in consistent in some ways or different in how we will give details when I give these proofs. So the first thing is about having to, um, how the input encoding will be done. And so if you were to, if I were to ask you to implement this one, for example, on, on an actual one, a Turing machine that simulates this, you would have probably gone around and say how to represent B itself, the machine, and it's just a five tuple. And so it's got these five components. You could in fact enumerate them and, 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 and that representation would be how you will encode it. And the simulation would be just directly how the you know, transition functions and so on would work on B. M may do this directly by having it to record it on its state, basically. And so, and, and so the simulation part is easy to implement, and, and so is the encoding part of it. So the language that talks about accepting an input for um, a DFA is decidable. The second example we want to look at is exactly the same problem, except that now we want to look for NFA. And, and, and so the format is the same. We have an accept uh, language, an acceptance language. It will take the input BW, but this time B is an NFA instead of a DFA that represents the input. And the result we have for this one is also positive, and this is a decidable language. I'm going to turn to the next slide and tell you how we will prove this one. But if you have seen the first one that I did, you may immediately say, we, do, we can do this uh, the same way. We prove we can prove the same way. We design another Turing machine. We can call it some other name this time. But just like we have simulated the DFA with the Turing machine, and we will accept when it accepts and will reject when it is in an unaccepting state, we could do exact same thing. And you're right, we couldn't do that because we can simulate what the NFA is doing. But for, the, for, for fun and, and for learning a couple other things too, we will do prove this one differently. And the way we would present, uh, we, we would prove this one is we will present a Turing machine, this time we'll call it N, that decides this. And instead of making N simulate an NFA, we will make it use the DFA that we constructed in the previous proof, and we've called it M, we will use it as a subroutine. I want to point out a couple of things here. And we'll walk through uh, what, how our proof works uh, also. Uh, there is a very nice pattern that you will observe, um, and some of these examples will build on top of each other. This is perfectly good example, for example, to see what you just proved could be used for proving another thing. Mathematically speaking, uh, this is our, this is the art of how you will do things. You would, you know, accumulate knowledge and then whatever it is that you have used before, you will use it. I know some of you would do is math 216, for example, you might have encountered it. There are many, many, many other places, even when you do advanced things, you would not have to prove everything from scratch all the time. So, so you may have established the result and that would be the one that you would invoke for doing something else. And so in these constructions of, or, or the layout of these problems and, and or, or the, how the decidability problems come and how we prove them, you will notice that. And here is one good example where we make use of a, a theorem, a result that we proved just three seconds or a minute ago to, to prove it in, in, in this one. So because we know how to do when things are in DFA, now we will use this as a subroutine. And so our uh, Turing machine N now would take on input B and W. Uh, this is what the input is where 
this time around B is an NFA and W is a string. And so we're going to convert the NFA B into an equivalent DFA, and we'll call it C, using the procedure for, the, for this conversion. What you will notice now, every time you see me block things like this, the, the, the text is taken from the book. So, so the theorems are named after how they have been called in the book. And so I wanted to remind you what these theorems are. And that's what this, you see in these yellow boxes. You will see this in my upcoming slides also. I think this will be a good way for you to remember. Uh, maybe this is a good time for you for me to invite people. So I'm going to I will explain this, but you, you can get busy on the group chat. I'm going to ask this question, and I'm not going to name it on uh, question one, two, three, because they were our warm-up question. But this one is not a warm-up question. How many of you do have hard copy? So hard copy or PDF? Do you just write? You've got, I will assume all of you have got the book, but just write hard copy or then PDF. I will continue to explain, but 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 write write what 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 you have just so I know. Okay. So 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 that means you can go back and look at this theorems. Another point I want to tell you, uh, in, in addition to having to use a result that we have used one part to use it to prove another one, there is one thing that the book has a good uh, nature or, or maybe a unique style. Some of these theorems, uh, you might have noticed them already. And every time we, we see something like that, I have been pointing out in class, they are actually algorithms. And so you would see a result that says every NFA has an equivalent DFA. That's what theorem 139 would say. And this yellow box like right there would do that fairly okay. And so we would be happy. But what is being used in our simulate or in our you know step one of the algorithm for this Turing machine is not just the fact that NFA and NFA is equivalent to DFA, no. It's the procedure we used in that proof. So the, there is some good things that you would, maybe lasting things you would learn from this book uh, in addition to how things have come across so far. And that is some of these proofs are actually algorithmic descriptions. That means constructive proofs are good. When you can have constructive proofs like this, they would be turned into algorithms. You would encounter these things many times in your life when you can give one. It's not always possible to give constructive proofs, which means algorithms, but when they are possible, it's a great thing to do. They are much, much, much preferable, in my view, from having to prove things in using induction and so on. It becomes sometimes a little bit um, uh, fuzzy, and you may not appreciate what actually is going on. It looks more like a mechanical uh, in, you know, application of a certain technique. So, so the book has been very light on inductive proofs. You might have noticed, and I have been also very light, except for a couple times we have not. But some other approaches for dealing with theories around this one are heavily dependent on inductions, and I do not appreciate that very much. So what is being invoked here is, um, you will go back and review it, is how we did do to convert NFS into DFS within, you know, by having all of the power sets possible and things like that, right? So stage one is possible. You can convert an NFA B to an equivalent C using this procedure. And we, everyone in the class knows how to do this. Then the second step will be, we run the Turing machine now on M from Terum 4.1. That is exactly the one we saw now on input CW, the one that would simulate, that one that would say accept when we have arrived at an accepted state and reject otherwise. That's the, the simulation part at least. And then we would accept, if it is accept, we will otherwise reject. So uh, what did we just learn? Uh, maybe not so very much, but we have at least used as a subroutine, the Turing machine can also have things that look like that, that we would normally do when we implement things on computers now. But the other thing we have seen is something not very surprising perhaps, because we already know NFAs are equivalent to DFAs. And so if the DFA, the language of acceptance on it, was decidable, we should not be surprised that a language that is talking about NFS is also decidable. And so in that sense, there is no big surprise that it is decidable. But we know, we know more. We know more, and, and let's call this one regular language. We know that they are regular language. There is another way in which we can look at regular language, and it is through regular expressions. And so what if somebody, instead of giving us in the form of an NFA or a DFA, had actually formulated a question around regular expression? So we could, now say uh, we have an input, uh, it's a regular expression, and we have an, a string, 
is a language that takes this decidable. We'll call this one A. We've been calling this A, A, A so far. It's all about acceptance. The first one was DFA, the next one was NFA, and now we have something given in the form of a regular expression. Is this decidable is the question we are trying to answer, and, and we have the answer right there. We This is decidable. And, and, and I probably will spend just a minute on the proof of this one, but you should not find it too surprising. So we will now present. We presented a Turing machine called M for the first one. We presented a Turing machine called N for the second one for NFAs. And this time we'll call it a P that decides this particular language. And so it takes this input where R is a regular expression and W is our string. So now uh, we have kind of learned the trick now. So, so we will convert the regular expression to an equivalent NFA. When somebody gave us an NFA, we convert it to a DFA so we could apply a theorem that we just learned. So we can convert this regular expression R also to an equivalent NFA by using the procedure for this conversion given in another theorem. And that language, that, that theorem talks about the language is regular if and only if some regular expression describes it. We did do spend uh, maybe at least half a portion or maybe an entire portion of our lecture at that time when how to do this conversion. So, so we're invoking that. And so go back and look at how uh, you can turn a regular expression into an, an NFA. After we do that, then we run the Turing machine N on the one that has become now our way of dealing with the regular expression we got on this input. And if it accepts, we accept. If it rejects, we reject. So the proofs were, were there. So what did we learn from what we saw so far? So the previous three results illustrate that for at least decidability purposes, uh, we, it's equivalent to present the Turing machine with a DFA, an NFA, or a regular expression because the machine can convert one form of the encoding to another. Uh, but they are also equivalent to one another. But we, to begin with, we have, we have seen them. But remember what we are trying to do. We're trying to do now using Turing machines to determine decidability. And so we're relying on the Turing machines to doing that. So the knowledge of the equivalence between these ones is not in itself sufficient. It is helpful because we now can use it, but the Turing machine should be able to do that. And the power of it lies in being able to convert one to another form. And so basically these three are three phases of the same thing, computationally speaking. They are not very different. Uh, we can convert one to another one. And, and the proofs we have for having to establish their equivalence is what the Turing machine is utilizing in encoding them. And it will, you know, it, we established one result for DFA and we relied on it to convert to these other ones. Let's do now a couple more. So this was about acceptance. And so if you remember the outline I gave you in the beginning of the lecture, we were going to look at acceptance and we were going to look at emptiness and we were going to look at the equivalence of two DFAs. These were the three things we were going to look at with finite automata for the purpose of decidability. And we will continue, continue and look at these ones and we will uh, know that the theorems would all be about decidable because that's the class we are looking at now. So the results will be decidable, no surprises. We'll wait until Friday to see some problems that are not decidable and we'll look even more when we get uh, on Monday uh, next time. So problem number four, anybody counting now? So, so I have promised five, we are on number four. We are now going to call this thing E, and, and I have a typo there. So when I finish this, the recording will say A, unfortunately, but when I at least put the, just the slides, it will be called an E. So the language we're looking at now is E for emptiness. And so it doesn't have a string. So it's a language, A is, is, is a DFA, and the language of it is just empty set. Uh, and this doesn't look very inspiring. So, so we've been looking at these languages so far, and we were deciding whether it's a, you know, something is a member of that language. Now we want to see if it is empty. And, 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 and on, on its face, it doesn't look like something exciting, but there are some times when we would, know, we would want to know if a language is empty. So it, it is an important problem. And the result we have around it is positive. The language of emptiness, uh, 
when we have a DFA is a decidable language. And that A will be corrected into E in when I get it uh, on most book. Let's prove it. So we are going to take a DFA that accepts some string if and only if reaching an accept state from the start to state by traveling along the arrows of the DFA is possible. Okay, uh, so, so this is what it means to accept. When we have a DFA, it will accept a string if we have a way to, if you remember what we do, you know, when we have, you know, an input string, we'll take it one at a time, we'll follow the transition functions and so on. So, so imagine that you a state diagram. And so how you would accept some string would be if there is a way for me to start from the starting state, follow the arrows by taking one of the things that will be dictated by that state and what input I have read. And I follow this and I arrive at a place where there is an accept, that's when we would accept it. To test this condition, we can design a Turing machine now that uses make marking an algorithm similar to the example on connected graphs. Because uh, the connected graph example told us, basically it, it was a graph, but we were following you know, the ages and making sure that we were marking something when it was an age to, to, to determine that it was um, equivalent, sorry, uh, this is the place where I want to be. So to, to show that it was equivalent and to show that uh, the, the graph was connected, we needed to visit a node at a time and mark things so that we would know if the graph is connected. Now we have a DFA and we wanted to trace ages and make sure that we have from the start the state to the end state we can reach for this input. So, so there is some similarity about how, what we are doing in these two cases. And I spent some time in the beginning of the lecture telling you details about how that connected graph problem was implemented after I showed you the, the, the encoding to just simply indicate that there is a way for us to mark this successfully when we are doing it on a Turing machine. That is why why I spent some time talking about it because we need it here. So we have a Turing machine and we have our lang or uh, A, the, the input A, where it is a DFA. And so we want to start by marking the start state. Look how similar this one is with the connected com components uh, question we had on the graph. And we repeat until no new states get marked. And we mark any state that has a transition coming into it from any state that is already marked and we accept if it is marked, otherwise we reject. And so this will, if no accept is marked, we accept. So notice the negation there. It might have slipped your attention. Uh, we are looking for emptiness. And so if this was not there, then we are doing exactly what the input, the machine would do when act for accepting. So we, if this doesn't happen, there is no place where this has happened. So it accepts nothing, basically it's empty. And therefore, we have proved that it is decidable. The way we have been proving, in case you have lost me in you know, the number of things we have discovered so far, is do I have a Turing machine that I exhibit that will decide this? When I do that successfully, it is called decidable. And so we just did. We have created a Turing, we designed a Turing machine T that will do this and tell us when the, when the language is empty. Step number four is, is a no, and that's why it is accepting. I want to watch out our time. Oh, it's 11 already. Okay. Uh, there was one more. Okay, so, so this is where I get guilty all the time. Somebody has to tell me when we are a minute left. I'm going to not uh, risk those people who have class afterwards do. So let me stop. There is only one left. It's about equivalence and it's a short one. I'll have the slides up. And, and I think you can read on it. Promise me you'll take a look at the slide. And, and so otherwise, I'll start with this one next time. All right, the time is up. If you have any questions, let me know. Let me give us a minute or two for people to ask. Otherwise, we'll stop in a second. OK, can people give me thumbs up if things went well today? Or, or something indicate there, yes or no, or something like that, just I know. OK. Great. Uh, okay, so I'll see you next time. Uh, if you have questions on homework six, uh, to, I have office hour today and make sure to use uh, James's office hour on Thursday. We'll pick up from where we left today on Friday and I'll see you then. Take care.